Hello, 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 and welcome. My mayor on Kalili. We are DM25, a radical political movement for Europe, and this is another live discussion with our coordinating team featuring subversive ideas you won't hear anywhere else. And today we're looking at the war in Ukraine. It's been over a year since we last tackled this topic on our live stream, so here are some quick facts to put you in the picture. Over half a million military casualties on both the Russian and Ukrainian sides. Over 30,000 civilian casualties. Hundreds of billions of dollars given to support Ukraine's war effort from the West, from the US, from NATO countries. Millions of people displaced. Damages in Ukraine exceeding $150 billion. Russia now controls a fifth of Ukraine's territory and population, and the war has been stuck in a bloody stalemate for months. Now, you might think it'd be time for a ceasefire and for peace talks, as the M25 has pushed for since Putin invaded Ukraine in February 2022. Yet negotiations to end the war appear to be further away than ever. In fact, tensions have been ratcheting up between Russia and NATO, especially in recent weeks. French President Macron refused to rule out sending troops to Ukraine, provoking a backlash. Scholz, the German leader, stated that British soldiers, soldiers are already fighting there. Putin warned of nuclear consequences if NATO intervenes. His leading critic, Navalny, died in custody. The New York Times exposed CIA spy bases along the Ukrainian border near Russia. And both the US and Europe are stepping up their military support for Ukraine, although to what end, it's uncertain. So, with far-right parties surging across the EU ahead of the European elections in June, and Donald Trump likely to return as US president, what do these latest developments in Ukraine mean for Europe and for the world? Is a direct confrontation between nuclear powers unavoidable, or does the possibility for a negotiated peace still exist? Our panel, including our own Yanis Varoufakis and our crew of activists, experts and thinkers and doers from across Europe, will be weighing in on this topic. And you, you out there, if you've got thoughts, rants, comments, things that pop into your head, then please put them in the YouTube chat and we'll put them to our panel. Yanis will be joining us a little bit later today. Let's hand the floor over now to Karin de Rigo, our lead candidate for our German bid in the European election in June. Karen Fogels. Thank you, Maron. So the war in Ukraine is at a critical point. After two years, Zelensky is weaker and hence is in a precarious position. He doesn't have soldiers anymore. He does, the economy is suffering. The international support has decreased because now the focus has shifted to Palestine. And the latest decision to build a defensive line at the borders of over 2,000 kilometers reveals that the hope for victory is for more, more far now than ever. If we want to be optimistic, then uh, it's exactly when a situation stalls that there is space for a negotiation. Unfortunately, Zelensky, uh, doesn't, who doesn't decide anything anyway, seems to refuse any dialogue because the claims he does over Crimea are totally unrealistic. And the USA keeps sending any kind of, kind of military equipment without end. Russia is doing its usual propaganda. And in Europe, Macron, Ursula von der Leyen are calling for an increase in weapons, um, weapons production, sending troops. Um, I recently read that the Italian defense minister declared that Europe has a low producive capacity for weapons and it should be increased. So when our politicians speak about helping Ukraine, it is such a hypocrisy. It's a huge lie. They are sending our money to the US, to the top five armed companies in the world. And these companies are owned by investment funds. There is where our money is going, with the only hope that they will get a slice of the cake in the end, in the reconstruction phase. So all the attempts to solve the, the, the situation through, diplo through diplomacy have been sabotaged from the West from the beginning. They were lying on the power of sanction and on the ability and the power of the Ukrainian army. And now Ukraine risks to be sacrificed in this geopolitical battle. To answer to the question of our live stream today, is there a risk of nuclear war? Well, as long as there have been atomic bombs, there will always be the risk. Let's be honest about that. 
since the Second World War, they have been used as a deterrent, and it's exactly what Putin is doing also right now. He wants, I don't really think he will start throwing bombs uh, without any reason. But if we think that this is the, uh, this arms race is going to end the war, then we are really making a huge mistake. And we need to do everything possible to stop the madness of these warmongers in Europe and in the United States, because it's really too late. Um, with MERA 25, one of our most important points is exactly to call for disarmament, to get Europe out of this imperialistic logic and to propose a new frame for the international cooperation, because every person, every population deserves nothing but peace. Thank you, Karen. Amir, Amir Kiai, our policy coordinator based in The Hague. What's your take? Thank you, Mehran. My take is that we actually have to accept that it's going to continue for a while. Um, there's been in this two uh, more than two years now, and of course, even longer if we talk talk about 2014 and all the internal strife and internal civil war, etc. Um, there has really been very little, if any, move towards resol resolving this through political or diplomatic means, um, and it this is the this is the direction that has been set. And if we look at the recent comments of Macron, initially, I think personally, I was also a little bit skeptical because Macron likes to talk things up a bit. But now I, I saw reports today about um, French uh, TV channels, you know, displaying a graph of Ukraine and highlighting scenarios of where French troops could be placed in, for example, things like that. So it's getting to that point of the narrative is getting... Uh, much more ser serious about placement of French troops, etc. So it looks like this um, uh, we're on a, another round of escalation or, and further militarization of this of this of this conflict, but also of other conflicts. So we see this in in Gaza. Uh, there's again no 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 pressure being applied on Israel at all um, to you know f resolve this diplomatically, etc. Politically. Um, and we will also see this unravel. We see this in Haiti, for example, with, again, no pressure to resolve anything uh, diplomatically. Even Kenya is getting brought in now and to supply um, policing troops uh, to Haiti. They're under a lot of pressure from the Americans to do that. Um, so we see this um, American guns first approach being applied everywhere. There's a problem. Uh, guns are the solution. That's how it is at the moment. Um, and uh, look, the, the reality is that the the the, the base uh, political philosophy of the United States um, is, you know, is is on the gun first, shoot first, and talk uh, talk later, um, and is shaped by sort of a totalitarian view of the world in terms of trying to control everything. Um, so we having these um, this this reference points that just point point to us. Uh, point to us that we are looking at a further conflict. We, we're not going to see peace in that sense. Except, of course, it's um, um, what can we do and what how we can use our public pressure and our public voice and et cetera, et cetera. And we can come to that later on in the, in the hour that we have. Thank you, Amir. Yanis has just joined us. Yanis, the is yours. Hello, everyone. Regarding the question of... Um, the likelihood of nuclear war and of this um, um, combination of a First World War trench warfare uh, and Afghanistan, because uh, this is what, remember, the, on the first week after Putin's invasion of Ukraine, in our regular live stream, this is what we were saying. We were saying that this is going to end up uh, as a combination of trench warfare, in the style of the Great War, the First World War, and something like Afghanistan. And this is exactly what is happening. Uh, the difference here is that the narrative that Joe Biden uh, adopted personally, and I'm not sure that it was the Biden administration, I think it was to a very large extent Biden himself and some people very close to him. And I'm saying that you know, I'm casting doubt on whether this is a, a general Joe Biden administration 
attitude because they've tried his people try to roll it back you know to backpedal and then he pushed forward again and what am i referring to the threat that issued the proclamation that putin will be dragged through the international criminal court which is by the way a court that um the United States does not recognize, which is, you know, hypocrisy uh, magnified to such a level that it is ridiculous. But anyway, uh, this is not a question of whether Putin should be dragged through the International Criminal Court. I would like to see him in the International Criminal Court personally, but I would, I would also like to see Tony Blair and George W. Bush and even Barack Obama. Uh, you know, actually, every American president since, um, let's say, JFK <laughs> should be dragged to the International Criminal Court. <laughs> um, but that is not the point. The point is that once you tell one of the combatants in the Ukraine war who owns 1,550 nuclear warheads that his defeat will mean his, um, you know, end of days being spent in uh, a prison in The Hague. Essentially, what you are doing is you are telling him that if you lose the conventional war, fire your nuclear weapons. This is the message from Joe Biden. This is why Joe Biden is such a clear and present danger for humanity. Uh, will it happen? Look, ever since we invented, as humanity, atomic weapons, and then nuclear weapons, and then hydrogen bombs, and then uh, proton bombs, and so on and so forth. Uh, that has always been the the great unknown. Those who have their button, uh, press the but that button, knowing that it, it will be the end of uh, humanity. That is a, a question that no one can possibly answer. What we do know is that uh, the West has taken a regional conflict that should never have been allowed to take place to occur and which should have been quelled immediately by means of the proposals that we, DiEM25, have been, or along those lines, a similar proposal, it doesn't have to be the precise proposal of DiEM25, but something along the lines. You know, essentially, a trade. Uh, the Russian troops go back to barracks, to where they were before February 2022, in exchange for uh, the neutrality of Ukraine. Independence, but neutrality out of NATO, just like Austria remained out of NATO during the whole of the Cold War. Uh, and that allowed Austria to actually develop very nicely along the lines of you know, social democratic or liberal democratic lines. So that is the, you know, my answer to the question is how likely is a nuclear war? We have no idea. But what we know is that Joe Biden has, with, his, with the help of the whole of NATO, the unthinking and unquestioning attitude of European leaders, they have all been complicit in creating a nuclear threat out of an awful humanitarian catastrophe in Ukraine. In Ukraine. Uh, but let's let me let, let's have a, a look at what Amir was saying before. I didn't catch most of I caught most of it of what you said, Amir, but not all of it. Uh, apologies for my late entry. <laughs> transport problems. Okay. Uh, the problem, as I see it, comrades, friends, is that um, a warmonger's Europe has already taken shape as a result of the Ukraine war. Uh, Amir spoke about Emmanuel Macron playing a very silly catch-up game in relation to Le Pen. Uh, Macron is facing uh, obliteration in the European Parliament elections in the hands of Le Pen. His whole project of creating a new force in politics is uh, clearly failed. And his second term is uh, uh, essentially deflating like a burst balloon. And now he has a new hobby horse. And that is to call upon the French to prepare for war against Russia, uh, which is completely out of character, even by Emmanuel Macron. It just goes to show the desperation of the man and the extent to which he, doesn't, he really doesn't mind jeopardizing peace worldwide just in order to to find another hobby horse because every other hobby horse he had like the idea of a, a political union a fiscal union a federal treasury and so on all ideas that were 
more or less reasonably. <laughs> um, they fell by the wayside, and now he's replacing them with a wholly unreasonable and uh, you know a clear and present danger to to, to humanity of a policy. Uh, so using Putin's uh, stalled Ukraine war as a pretext, he has replaced this. Remember how he came to power with this vision of a political union. A lot of the ideas he had stolen from DM25, and I can attest to that. I'm not. This is not. Uh, me <laughs> being on behalf of DM25 uh, uh, overly overly uh, optimistic about our influence, but I do know because he actually told me himself, even the idea of citizen assemblies, which he used in order to quell the gilets jaunes, if you remember, he took a lot of ideas from DM25, which is not a problem, except that he completely misconstrued and, hum and, 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 and essentially distorted them. But he replaced this vision of a political union, however distorted it was, with a vision of a war union. That's how he sees now the European Union. And it's not just him. Charles Michel, um, the president of the European Council, you've read his letter, I'm sure, recently, is now calling for European Union targets. Uh, not, not just targets, but a whole project which begins with EU targets for us as the European Union to buy twice as many weapons from European arms dealers by 2030. You saw that. And how to pay for that? The European Union is bankrupt. Right? They can't afford to pay for anything. <laughs> we have deindustrialization, we have a German fiscal situation which is pathetic. The answer is he will pay for the weapons using profits from Russian frozen assets. So that would be, which of course is, by the way, something that the European Central Bank completely disapproves of, because that would be a, a very serious danger for the euros, the euro area's credibility as a safe place for oligarchs to put their money in. Again, I'm not passing judgment, I'm simply stating it. Um, he even mentioned the idea of a euro bond. Can you imagine that? We don't have a euro bond for making our European Union, Monterey Union, palatable to the majority, but he wants a euro bond in order to pay for guns and ammunition. And he even wants the European Investment Bank. Did you hear that? That, that is the epitome of idiocy. He wants the European Investment Bank to um, secure loans or to, to guarantee loans uh, that will go into buying weapons. Now, the European Investment Bank, I know that I was a governor of the European Investment Bank some time ago, has a clear limit. It's in the charter to make productive investments, investments like, like on bridges and things that increase incomes. Now, <laughs> he's asking the European Investment Bank to spend money to give loans uh, to build ammunitions that hopefully will not be used, unless, of course, we want, we want to use them. And then, But then who pays for them? They, who will repay the loans to the European Investment Bank? Now, you know, a German order liberal, like, you know, the spirit or the ghost of Wolfgang Schäuble would be up in arms against that. And, you know, in this letter, Charles Michel tries to sell this to us as a way to create jobs and growth. Can you believe that? Remember Juncker? The Juncker plan, which was completely inconceived, ill-conceived, and financially made no sense. But that the, the idea there was to invest in green technologies, in things that, you know, in digital technologies. Now, that is gone, the Juncker plan, and we have the Michel plan, where, you know, another pipe dream for boosting investment in technology and innovation that will go, however, it will follow the Hitler path, not the Roosevelt path. Right, not the New Deal of Roosevelt, but the Hitler path of creating growth through defense spending, through building armaments. You know, I mean, the only way of of, of um, concluding this to say that, on the one hand, Macron and on the, one, on the other hand, Michel are painting a picture of the European Union that even the radical centers of two years ago, a year ago, would not recognize anymore. I, if, if to put it somewhere slightly differently, Vladimir Putin's greatest triumph is that he changed the DNA of the European Union. He changed the way the European Union establishment thinks of itself. 
And the only good news for Europeans and the world is that the European Union is incompetent. So in the same way that the Juncker plan fizzled out and nothing happened, well, I hope that the Charles Michel and the Emmanuel Macron plan will fizzle away. It probably will, because incompetence is guaranteed in the European Union. But it is a very sad day when the prospects for peace in the, Europe, in, in the European Union and in Europe generally, and the prospects for some sanity depend on incompetence ruling in the final analysis. So if you take together this war union with the white super... ...outer border, Frontex, we went from financialized cosmopolitanism, this was a situation before 2020, let's say, to an ethno-original white supremacist nationalist Europe. Consider this, and this is how I'm going to finish. Let's suppose that Michel gets his way and we build the defense industry and we borrow money from the European Investment Bank to do so. Huh? Then how do we sustain them? The only way you can sustain this industry is by creating wars that create the demand for replenishing those stockpiles of weaponry. So suddenly, what is appearing, what is being presented as a defensive strategy for Europe is becoming a warmongering strategy. This is why I said that, in, that Europe is becoming a warmonger's delight. Uh, the language that these people now use uh, is so inflammatory that if Le Pen had used that language 10 years ago, I mean, the whole of Europe, including these people, the liberal center, the radical center, would have lambasted her. Um, so my final point, as somebody who intends to be a candidate in the European election, allow me to wear that hat for a moment, is that um, if uh, you good people out there vote for us for the European Parliament election next June, uh, our pledge to you is that we are not going to rely simply on European Union incompetence to preserve peace. If you send us to the European Parliament, we will work tirelessly to defeat Macron, Michel, and for the Lion, their agenda. And we are going to work in that manner, meticulously, carefully, enthusiastically, day in, day out. Thank you. Thank you for that, Yanis. Some comments from the chat. Mark Bulmer says that diplomacy should be done with Russia, America, China, and the United Nations should take over the world's nuclear weapons or some major nuclear treaty. NE says that I'm afraid sending Russian troops back to pre-2022 lines is off the table in negotiations. Russia has made that clear several times. Kat Terrell um, says Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed, Northop, Raytheon, Go Team big arms manufacturers that she's citing there. And a comment from David here in our, in our internal chat, which I think is useful, that there have been at least two known instances of computers falsely flagging Russia and the US having fired nuclear weapons in the past. Let's not forget it was the only reason, it was only reason that prevailed by the people who didn't pass the info up the chain. Lucas, Lucas Fabraro, communications director based in Berlin. What's your take on all this? Thanks, Marin. Um, so to begin by answering the question that, that's posed in the the title of this uh, of this conversation here, um, is nuclear possible? Is is it likely? Well, I'm gonna repeat what everyone here said and, and said that I don't know. Um, you'd be surprised to hear I'm not uh, I'm not smarter than uh, and than anyone else here, and not privy for any information that no one else is. But I think um, what is really concerning, or the several things are very concerning, but one of the things that uh, hasn't been uh, mentioned yet tonight, and it's a good, you know, what David just said is a good segue into this, is that I fear that what's been lost um, in, in recent years and in recent decades is a lack of appreciation for the possibility 
of nuclear conflict, which was something that was in people's minds all the time during the Cold War, of course. Um, and, you know, we, we saw those uh, instances that David mentioned there as uh, good examples of uh, um, points in which, well, these were sort of, you know, accidental points, but um, points nonetheless where we came close to, uh, to nuclear war. And there were other, you know, far more, with far more geopolitical weight behind them that also brought the war closer to annihilation. Um, that's not a good world to live in, of course. Um, but we have to remember that those weapons still exist. Um, but I, I fear that while the weapons are still there and ready to be deployed, we've lacked the respect for the destructive capabilities of those weapons. And I remember very early on in, in, uh, in, in the war in Ukraine, um, in the early days after Russia's uh, full-scale invasion, that uh, a huge topic, there was a lot of people in the West advocating for a no-fly zone to be established over Ukraine by NATO, essentially. And I found that that was extremely shocking, like the extent to which that seemed to be a popular idea. And it begs a question for me, what is it that people think that a no-fly zone entails? Like, do you decree that a no-fly zone exists and then, you know, the enemy just goes like, our ah, rats, and then, you know, I guess we can't fly our planes anymore? No, you have to shoot planes down. Um, and in this case, you have to shoot down planes, uh, you know, belonging to a nuclear power um, that has already shown a willingness to stake a tremendous amount of, uh, of of political and military capital in this uh, in in this uh, in this conflict in this region. Um, so I fear that you know that was a very gross example of uh, this sort of lack of appreciation for the threat of nuclear war early on in the in the in the conflict. Uh, um, but now you see it, you know, in 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 many ways, it hasn't um, diminished in the slightest uh, with this constant calls for more and more sophisticated weapon systems to, to be delivered to Ukraine, um, you know, which, of course, uh, risk a tremendous escalation that, again, could very well lead to, to nuclear conflict. Um, and in this sort of like um, ideological sort of uh, good versus evil uh, battle that exists in a, in, a, in a lot of people's minds in the, in the West, uh, the question that I ask is, how many more lives, you know, need to be lost in order for a point, essentially, I guess, to be proved? Because what we see on the ground is a stalemate. Um, the much lauded counteroffensive, it has stalled. Um, it is tragic to look at how many lives have been lost. We're talking dozens of thousands of lives to win, you know, a few kilometers here and there um, in, in the front line. Um, is a tragedy, and how how many more you know need to be lost uh, until we feel that our point is proved? Because uh, it doesn't look like this uh, stalemate is going to be is going to be broken. Um, and if it is, it's going to be in a catastrophic way. It's not going to be broken in a good way. Um, because again, the fact of the matter remains that Russia, Russia is a nuclear power, um, and so. Uh, this is all very concerning, and another concerning thing is, uh, you know, something that Jan has already spoke to at length, um, is that in in a sense the the die has been uh, cast as far as Europe is concerned. The the conflict has uh, already changed uh, Europe um, in a lot of ways, regardless of what happens um, in the future in terms of a, of a potential re resolution, which of course we continue to advocate for, um, you know, diplomacy, non-alignment, and so on and so forth. Um, too much political capital has been staked in this uh, new world uh, that uh, that has you know risen in, in Europe that has uh, arisen since uh, February of 2022, um, and you know just like it doesn't help to um, back putting into a corner by using the sort of uh, rhetoric that uh, Joe uh, Biden has been uh, has been using. Um, it doesn't make the world any safer. It doesn't. It doesn't help anyone. Ukrainians, Russians, Europeans, nobody. Um, the the capital that political leaders in Europe have staked in their position and and in their subservience to um, 
to the to to um, the interests of the United States at the end of the day. Um, that's something that they can't back out of because that would mean the end of their political careers. So I think that what we should do is bring about the end of their political careers by different means <laughs> to force their hand by replacing them um, in the European elections and in other elections to come. Um, and that's why that's what our Meta 25 parties are here for. So I again uh, echo Yanis's call for everyone out there to support us in this in this bids um, in June and well beyond June um, so that we can bring new people with different ideas um, and much less concern for our own political skin. As a matter of fact, we, we have none and we're proud of it. Thank you, Lucas. While you have the floor, let me ask you something, because I know that you're very active on the topic of Gaza and the, the massacre which has been going on there since October, also being carried out with American money and weapons. Um, in many of the activist circles that I'm in, um, when the Ukraine war, well, when Putin uh, invaded Ukraine in February 2022, there were many people who on the left who were very much Slava Ukraini, send Ukraine as much money as possible, um, they can win the war. Then after Gaza happened, after you know October 7th, and, and then what happened in Gaza and continues to happen, those same people were very much in favor of a ceasefire um, in Gaza. And I wanted to ask, I know these are two different conflicts, but do you think that the, the Gaza, what's happened in Gaza has changed the calculation somewhat? Is there more of an appetite for peace perhaps than there was before Gaza? And might this also um, influence uh, bringing about a, a negotiated settlement for Ukraine? I don't know, to be honest. I can I can only hope so. Um, you know, let's put aside the sort of like the geopolitical calculus and what has happened in Gaza, you know, how, how that might change your worldview in terms of you know, power balance or whatever, you know, uh, sort of uh, geopolitical terms that you might want to use. But just on an emotional level, um, I think it, it has, I mean, I think and I hope that it has changed a lot of people's minds about the meaning of war itself. Uh, because it is it, just, I feel that regardless of your political orientation has been impossible in the past few months not to see absolutely horrifying images um, almost daily coming out of Gaza. Um, and I feel that, I mean, I cannot imagine how someone might be, uh, you know, how, how you can't be shaken by this uh, to your very core. So I can only hope that at the very least, this raw, very unfortunate, very difficult um, emotional impact um, that I think a lot of people are experiencing uh, might lead to a, a, a rethink on, we're talking about, you know, appreciating the the, the potential horrors of nuclear war, but also uh, lead to a, a, a newfound uh, appreciation for the horrors of uh, conventional war as well. Um, if you can even call this a war, of course, um, you can't really, um, but, uh, you know, uh, the 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 massacring of innocents, the 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 the, the civilian toll of uh, of uh, military action. Um, so my hope again is that um, even everything else put aside, that this can also have an impact that we can take away uh, that will help us liberate uh, Palestine eventually um, in our lifetime, but also. Um, to um, avoid war and, you know, be more willing to fight for peace, which I think is a uh, art that uh, has been lost a little bit in the past uh, few decades, even amongst progressives. Thank you, Lucas. Eric, our political director, um, actually now based in Greece, not Brussels anymore. I'd like I have a question for you. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of far right surge which is going on at the moment uh, in in the EU, um, Portugal, the Netherlands, and in opinion polls uh, for the European elections. How might that impact the prospects of war or peace going forward? 
Well, Mehram, that's a good question. Um, we are in this tragic situation where some of the most reactionary, backward political parties in our continent um, are positioning themselves as uh, champions of peace. So, and you will see uh, Macron as an excellent case study of this. Um, same with the IFD in, in Germany. My cat feels very strongly about this, as you can probably hear in the background. Um, known anti-fascist, my cat. Um, the, they're positioning themselves opposite to the establishment. So where the establishment has been gun-ho on the war has been following blindly the indications and the, the, the orders of NATO and the United States, um, the far right has been positioning itself opposite that, often due to close links to Putin and his regime, um, but not only. So that creates a very awkward situation for other progressive forces such as us, um, because the tried and tested old technique that uh, the establishment has had of creating a bipolar political space where you're either for one position or the other um, forces us to appear as if we are uh, in agreement and on the same uh, side uh, as the far right, as fascist parties when we speak out against the war. So they oversimplify this by presenting us as being, um, I, I say us because obviously all of our mayors and the M25 then equivocally against the war um, and have been since day one, presenting us as being uh, Putin lovers, uh, as being uh, dangerous utopians or whatever else have you. So it really obfuscates and confuses the narrative and the discussion making it very awkward for anybody to speak out against the war lest they be compared to fascists. This is the upside down, tossy-turvy world that they've created through this narrative. Um, and it makes a lot of progressives um, hesitate to speak out against the obvious, right? So, and that's something that we haven't done. We haven't hesitated. We've been there since day one. We've taken the political... Um, we've paid the political price for that. And this question also kind of guides, I think, the conversation to where it really needs to go, which is the what is going on now in Ukraine, uh, to a certain extent also uh, the, the massacre of Palestinians in Gaza. This is the result of the West doing what it's always done, which is to export its internal political issues. So in the US, you've got the incredible conflict between Democrats and Republicans who can't agree on a budget, but agreed uh, last week to ban um, TikTok uh, almost unanimously, even though they haven't been able to agree on anything else, which also kind of shows you where their main uh, political fears of the US is right now, i.e. China, not so much uh, Russia. Um, so the, these conditions are basically exported internal conflicts. Same goes, as Yanis very well put it, uh, for the case of France, where essentially Macron is trying to position himself against Le Pen um, and therefore is driving his country and unfortunately the rest of the European Union, therefore probably most of Europe, deeper into this conflict. Um, same uh, situation in Sweden, which has joined NATO recently. That's a country where the far right, the Swedish Democrats, has been triumphing uh, election after election, and so on and so forth. Because war has its own momentum. When parties, political parties, and especially governments, cannot handle internal conflicts, they try to shift the attention of the voters of the population of society externally to an external enemy and unify, therefore, the population, the voters, society against that external threat. That is basically what many of our governments are doing incredibly cynically um, and very, very dangerously in order to try a Hail Mary last throw of the dice before the European elections to salvage whatever can be salvaged from their horrendous 
last few months and years of of polls most of um the center is uh, set up to fail against the far right so basically what is currently being done through ukraine and to a certain extent in gaza and the middle east is trying to externalize these internal issues that europe is facing its own weaknesses and throwing ukrainians Palestinians under the proverbial political and war bus. Um, this cynicism is what's driven so many of our uh, fellow citizens away from voting at all, because they can see it. It's not the people are not dumb. Uh, and therefore, I think our role in these elections is to show through exactly this um, stable and consistent position that we've had, um, that there can be political voices who stay true to what they believe, regardless of the political games that everybody else is playing. And through this stance, re-inspire a certain sense of hope in politics, not in creating immediate solutions, but electing representatives who will do what nobody else does, which is to say things uh, the way they see it and represent people uh, regardless of the kind of pressures that they might be under. I li I think Yanis is very right in saying that we shouldn't lie to people and pretend that through the European Parliament we can change anything. We can't. It's designed to be uh, impossible to change anything through the European Parliament. Uh, but what we can do is to use that as a platform uh, to speak out for what is right and create a bigger mass around some of these common sense things and an op opposing poll uh, to the onward march of, of the far right, because if we expect the establishment uh, to do that, uh, we'll just be seeing more of the same. Thank you, Eric. A couple of comments from the chat. Neil says, war is hell. Let the politicos do the fighting instead. Der Blinder notes that Mrs. Strack Zimmermann, um, a, a prominent uh, politician in Germany's FDP party wants to continue supplying all kinds of weapons to Ukraine. She's also on the board of Rheinmetall, which is the um, large German defense contractor. This is how politics is done in the EU, says Deb Linder. I did not know that, uh, what you say. Um, I can't verify it, but it would not surprise me. And Armando says, even the Pope was labeled Putinist. So carry on, guys. We need peacemakers. Panos. Panos Denos. Based in Greece, Thank yours. Thanks, Mehran. Hi, everyone. I note that uh, a couple of days ago, the UN Secretary General said that we are closer to nuclear war than we have been for decades. So that's one authoritative opinion. Um, also, a few days ago, we had Russian elections. And I noticed that uh, Germany came out and said that they don't recognize the result because the elections were a sham, which probably they were. And then I tried to find out who accept those elections and who congratulated Putin for winning. And it was China, Turkey, India, Korea. Basically, it was much harder to find uh, uh, countries that did not congratulate Putin, even though he came out a winner with 90%, even though, though the there were irregularities, even though his biggest political opponent died in prison. And what I'm trying to get at is that this person or this country has a lot of support in um, throughout the world, in the global south, for sure. And uh, they also have a war economy. They have many military options. They can they can bring the war to the Balkans. Um, Vucic yesterday or the day before, after signing an agreement with uh, Russia, said that um, it's uh, it's their decision when Serbia will invade Kosovo. They can bring the war to Transnistria, which is the eastern slice of Moldova. Um, like I said, they have a war economy, a hardened population. This is the the, the power, and that that Macron says has to be defeated. And that's why we don't exclude sending um, uh, ground troops. Um, well, before they are defeated, they, 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 have, they have many, many options, including uh, tactical nuclear weapons. If they feel threatened, uh, they will do that. And that is considered an 
um, uh, an escalation to avoid further escalation. Like we're serious about it. We're going to use nukes. It's not the end of the world, but we'll do it. But um, everyone knows that this is uh, this can really go out of control. So what I'm the point I'm trying to make is that the, the West insisting on their uh, core narrative that the Ukraine cannot lose, that Russia has to be defeated, and to rationally pretend that they can um, um, they can have a plan uh, for this to happen uh, is uh, is a bit of a scandal. The real scandal. The biggest scandal is that um, sooner or later, uh, some scientists are going to announce that we have passed the point of no return in terms of uh, the climate catastrophe. Um, we might, we probably have passed it already, or we're going to pass it soon. This is the existential threat for Europe and the world. This is the emergency. It's not nuclear war. I cannot understand. I cannot accept that we are not dealing with this. And we're dealing with this uh, other huge emergency, which is the war and nuclear war, which is completely artificial. I mean, it could be scaled down, uh, you know, tomorrow. So if we pass the point of no return, what is Macron or Biden or, or Schultz going to tell me that Ukraine had to win? And in the meantime, if this has happened, I know with mathematical certainty that the country where I live will be a desert all the forests are going to burn. You're going to have diseases. You're going to have mass migration. Before that, you will have war, violence. And if you survive, you will be ashamed of the things that you had to do in order to survive. This with mathematical certainty. So we're facing this. And instead, the headline is nuclear war, Ukraine must win, and this and that. So I'd like to conclude with this. For me, it is the biggest scandal for any government to put any sort of national interest whether it is for Ukraine, for their uh, economy, for their dying empire or whatever, to put any national interest above the supranational interest of averting climate change and not treating this as a number one priority. Because this will go against their national interest as well. And it is, it is very clear. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Panos. And uh, further to what you just said, uh, War is also terrible for the environment, as well as the absolute horrors um, that it inflicts on on populations. So I'm I'm reading a statistic here that says that the first year of the war, the Ukraine war, um, was equivalent to the roughly the annual emissions of Belgium. So bad news on all fronts. Let me just see who is next. Johannes, there we go. I lost you there, sorry, in the sea of text. Johannes Fair from Germany, the floor is yours. Don't worry, thank you. Um, yeah, I think, by the way, that's one of the reasons why uh, the big mil military industrial complex was never included in the Kyoto pro protocols and so on, um, to not shine light on the awful, awful statistics of that every military and especially, of course, wars have uh, uh, on, on the climate. Um, what I wanted to contribute with is a point that you asked earlier um, to Lucas if the war or, or the genocide, not the war, that happen, is happening in Gaza um, has made changes in terms of how we see uh, peace and war and how parties uh, positioning themselves um, on that topic. As Eric also explained in the past, suddenly the right-wingers were trying to present themselves as the, the peace lovers. I think in Germany, at least, the, the situation in the last month um, and what's going on in the Middle East has changed that a bit because in the past already, um, for example, the son of Benjamin Netanyahu he was quoted by the AfD, the right-wing party in Germany, online and shared those posts. Um, so you can see the, the clear links there. And if you look at the policy of the German government, which is awful uh, on this conflict, of course, if you look to the Conservative Party, the, the rhetoric is, is worse. That's, and that's the biggest opposition party in Germany. 
Plus, if you look then further right to the AfD, it is even worse. Um, when we were protesting uh, last month outside the German parliament against the right-wing surge in Germany, uh, both in the government and also in the polls uh, with the fascist AfD party rising, uh, our chants were Israel bombardiert, Israel bombards, AfD applaudiert, AfD applauds. Uh, and that is the reality. And there has been a change in, yeah, uh, of course, also, of, unfortunately, even the progressives in Germany, there's just a, a too small part of it, of them, of us, that are against this genocide actively um, and a lot of people are silent on it but I think on that conflict you can clearly see the old divide between the right being pro-war and pro uh, support uh, of these massacres and uh, us on the left uh, fighting against it thank you Johannes Daphne Daphne Delcara based in France hey. <clears throat> Hi, uh, I just also want to touch upon something is like um, there's been so much of, of, of obfuscation about like the clear uh, consequences of decisions made by governments. Normally, this would be the press's job to like communicate to the public what are the consequences, what are the options and so on. But of course, this whole uh, be it Palestine or uh, be it Ukraine, it's just been a complete like a dog and pony show from the start. Like where I don't know, Biden will say, "Oh, you know, we are opposed to what Israel is doing," as if like they have no like material uh, <laughs> um, relationships uh, with the Israeli government. And like, oh, we are just saying it's bad, but why is nothing happening? And it's very similar uh, with the with the war in Ukraine, where it's like, oh, we must aid, we must, but like what. And I'd like to come uh, to what Lucas has said. Until when? When is it enough? Like, there's nobody really drawing these boundaries uh, in the public sphere, let's say. Uh, and that's why it's so important to have non-career uh, politicians elected uh, that can at least stand up and, like, present these lines. Uh, so I want to say, well, all, uh, like, the mm, number I came across, which was really interesting to me, is that, uh, so according to a survey done by the European Council on Foreign Affairs, or relations, whatever, uh, 10 per, only 10% 10 of Europeans believe that uh, Ukraine can win the war. That's a very shocking number to me, 10% only. So then we must ask, what's the next step, right? But nobody's like, getting this real concrete conversation going. Uh, but like when Macron proposes sending troops, then that gets really real. That's something that everybody can understand instead of weird aid mingled with like military where you don't really know what is what. People understand aid maybe as food, others understand it as weapons. Uh, so once Macron says sending troops, then you see, like, for example, in the poll, 76% of French people are completely opposed to this. So I think that's very important. Uh, and uh, thank you, Lucas, for underlining that. And I just want to give these little numbers. Thanks. Thank you, Daphne. A couple of final comments from the chat here. Mark says the military industrial complex should be retooled into the infrastructure development complex. The Guni notes that NATO has never stated to where they would like to grow to. Patriotic Eek says people need to consider one scenario. What if the goal is nuclear war? And Sebastian asks something I often hear, actually. Um, if Russia wins and gets what they want and we let them, what is to stop them from asking for more and more? What's to stop them from invading the Balkans, Transnistria, etc.? And as I hand over to you, Yanis, perhaps you, if you could tackle that question, because we often hear it, that Putin has imperial ambitions and, and just won't stop and the negotiated pieces in his, uh, to his advantage. What would you say to that point? Mm -hmm. 
Well, there are a couple of questions. I'll answer that question. But first, there's another question from the chat, uh, Maren. Uh, one uh, or comment that uh, Ukraine had uh, inherited nuclear weapons from the Soviet Union, but it gave them up. And wasn't that a stupid mistake on behalf of the Ukrainians or something along those lines? Well, to our friend who put that um, comment on the chat, uh, I have a question. Suppose Ukraine had retained the Soviet nuclear weapons. What good would it have done? What good would it have done? They're completely useless. Imagine, again, the same scenario, February 2022, Putin's troops invade Ukraine, and Ukraine has nuclear weapons. Would Zelensky press the button? That would be humanity's annihilation. So Zelensky, unless he was a madman, complete madman, would not press the button, even if the Russian troops are storming Ukraine. So in a, in a sense, nothing would have changed. Because Putin would have uh, already worked that out. And we, he would have gone ahead anticipating that Zelensky would not press the button. And the United States would not let, let Zelensky press the button anyway. So that's that question. Now, coming to Sebastian's question that uh, Mehran, you asked me to comment on. Okay, suppose that you're right, and Russia is uh, a force that um, is unstoppable, and if they get their way in Ukraine, uh, they will then storm the Balkans, Germany, Poland, whatever. Now, if you believe that, then you should be arguing for um, uh, mobilization by NATO, German, French, American, Greek, Portuguese troops on the ground to stop, you know, a Hitler-like Putin. If you believe that, go ahead and advocate that. NATO is not advocating that. Yeah, all of Scholz is not saying no way. Yeah, there are going to be German troops in Ukraine. So you see the you see the hypo the hypocrisy there. They are talking about Putin as if he's a Hitler that wants to take the whole of the European continent, like Hitler wanted, and tried to, and almost succeeded. But at the same time, they're not prepared to do against Putin that which they did against Hitler. So they they don't believe it. If you believe it, advocate it. Uh, my uh, uh, estimation of Putin is that um, he's um, uh, only interested in uh, coalescing along Russia, the Russian-speaking areas. Uh, Russian-speaking areas like Don Donbass and Luhansk, which, uh, uh, in his view, were taken away from Mother Russia after the 1991 uh, disintegration of the Soviet Union. He doesn't have either the will nor the capability of moving beyond that. You could see that in Ukraine, he stalled. His, fa his war was a failure. He may be inching forward today after three years, but militarily he has not won and he's nowhere near winning and i don't think he has a, I, he has a capacity to do it uh now let me look at it from a, a different perspective the moment putin ordered his troops in russia dm25 we came out with a very principled position we were not neutral we didn't say ah we don't take sides remember what we said we're always on the side of the invaded, whether they're the Ukrainians, the Yemenis, or the Palestinians. We are always with those whose land is occupied by a foreign army. When Mariupol was destroyed and the theater, the beautiful theater, was turned into smithereens and the hospital was bombarded with much loss of life, by the Russians, we came out and condemned the Russians for that. But we were the only consistent political force because we did the same when Gaza was invaded, when the Gazan 